just the people coming on now who might not have seen Tanya's message, she said there'd be a, like about a five minute delay. Hi, everyone. Morning. Apologies. I had to uh, suddenly, whatever. Too much, too many things going on, trying to balance too many things. <laughs> um, great to see everybody. Wonderful to have you all here. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm, let, let's just begin by saying that Firstly, um, majority of you, I can see there's a couple of new faces we'll get to in a minute. Majority of you have been with me last year, the year before in this reading group and very, very excited to have you back. We are going to be cognizant of the fact that there's going to be a couple of new people that are in the group. And therefore, there may be, especially for the first class or two, uh, some repetition, um, just in terms of Rabbi Sachs and his background and what we're doing and the books that we've all read together already, which are the other participants who have come in wouldn't necessarily have read. Um, so I just want those of you that have been with me for the last year or two to just be patient in terms of knowing that there may be repetition that is going to happen. Um, I... I want to begin, um, I want to say the following thing, God's willing, the aim is that we will be, we really, this class is really not suitable for Zoom. Although having said that, I am doing a similar class on Zoom in Jerusalem, and I do feel that, or for Jerusalem, I should say, not in Jerusalem. And I'm just trying to get my, um, second, I'm getting my lighting so camera looks normal. Um, and I will say that it that it does work. It can work on Zoom. It's definitely not ideal. Um, and my hope is that next week we will be able to come back and be in person in the class. I really hope um, that will be the case. Um, but I imagine that over the next few weeks, hopefully not more than that, there will probably we will probably have to do maybe some classes on Zoom. I'm not sure. God's willing, once we get through this kufa, this period, um, we will be back in in and together as a group. Okay, I want to just, if possible, ask whoever they, whoever can to open up your cameras. It really is important that we see everyone, and especially um, when we're doing the reading group. I'm just going to um, go round to the people that are new on this group. Uh, there are people that we already know. In truth is, maybe everyone just introduce yourself. I want to explain what, how I see the set out for today. We have till half past 10 together. What I would like to do is, number one, I want us to do some introductions. There's a couple of people I know who um, are, are definitely still going to be part of this reading group, but just so happen could not come today. Um, but the people that are on Zoom at the moment, what I'd like us each to do is I'm just going to call your name, open up your microphone, give a very brief instruction, explain if you were here last year in the group already. And if you weren't, I know that I know, but for the other people um, and um, say who you are. 
that's the first part of the class. The second part of the class is I want to, I feel like we can't go jump straight into our classes without giving some kind of background into what's everything that's going on at the moment. And I mean background, I mean, I want to share with you a few of Rabbi Sachs' thoughts that have been super helpful for me anyway, over the last few weeks and explain why I think that um, Rabbi Sachs' voice is a voice even so called from his grave is a voice that we really be need to be hearing today. So that's the second thing I want to do. And the third thing I'd like to do is to jump in and give a background to who Rabbi Sachs was, have a look a bit of uh, a biographical uh, a story of who he was, which again, we, we did at the beginning of the course last week, last year, I've added some extra things, some extra stories that we didn't have, which I think are really important. And to understand who Rabbi Sachs was the man. Okay, so let me just begin. Um, I'm doing it on, from where I can see on my screen. Let's begin with Reba. Do you want to just Don't say hi? Don't you with me. I'm in a mix up with the printer. Carry on. Carry now on. that is an introduduction to Reba. There you go, everyone. Just carry on. Carry Jan. on. Jan. Yeah, okay. Um, I go by Jan or Janet. It depends on who people know me. Um, um, I was in the class last year. Um, if you remember last year, I said I joined the class because it was the only thing that fit my time schedule. And um, yes. I'm back. Well, that must be a good sign, Janet, I guess. <laughs> it's a great sign. <sighs> Fabulous. Wonderful to see you. Okay, I have here Victor. Is that right? Just unmute yourself, Victor. Yeah. 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 Um, well, I've read quite a few of Jonathan Sachs' books. I've met him several times. Um, I had the privilege of introducing him a couple of times in my uh, congregation in England. And but obviously, I don't know if I've read the ones that you're dealing with. Okay, and even if you had, to be honest, even better if you have read them, because the part of the idea of the reading group is that we all are able to discuss them and bring ideas, and hopefully be, I'll be able to navigate the kind of underpinnings of the books. You're in Israel at the moment, I presume. Yes, yeah, Tam and Ali are Okay, so you'll be, you'll be able to come in person to the classes, please, God yes. in Renana. Excellent. Right. Okay, well, we look forward to um, yes. to uh, you I've, being part of this amazing in, week that we have. I've been in Tammy's class for a couple of years. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, fantastic. So I'm really excited that you're going to be with us. That's I'm nice. sure you will add a lot to our discussions. So thank you. Okay, Chava. Hi, good morning. Um, I've been in the class two years, starting my third uh, so that's saying something. I wouldn't miss this class for the world. I live in Carnation Rome, near Janet. Um, and Tanya, you mentioned that, you know, there may be some repeat information, but review for me is always great. And I'm actually very happy that we're starting with one of Rabbi Sachs's books that we did two years ago. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. It's great. I think it's wonderful. Because I don't okay. know how much it's I remember be, from them. And the, the discussion in this group is always very enlightening. Yeah, number one, let's not forget that it's not just me speaking. So even if we had read it two years ago, which I know we did, and there's quite a few people here, Persia, Matty, I'm um, looking who else would have been with us that read it two years ago. Um, I think the obviously discussion is always different. And also I'm going to, I want us to come for it also having had the background of all the books that we've read until now, which I think, because when we read it, we read it as part of the philosophy reading group. Now we're reading it as part of the Rabbi Sachs reading group. And I think having all the background behind us of the other books that he's done, is going to be very important to kind of putting a slightly different frame on it. So I'm really here to, glad to hear that. Thanks, Cover. Okay, Emma. Hi, good morning. Emma Bagel from Natanya. Um, I have lots of Rabbi Sachs's books on my shelves, but have not actually, you know, read any of them from cover to cover. So um, I'm very honest here. Wow, I'm honest. Here. Wow. That's <laughs> my honest God. I'm uh, I'm very much looking forward to this class because a I would love to read more of his work, and b if I'm going to read them, then who better to read them with than a Rabbi Sachs scholar herself? So um, <laughs> I'm very much looking forward to being here. Thanks, Emma. 
I know Emma, if we grew up, kind of grew up together in, in London, and Emma's been coming to some of my classes in the Tanya, and I'm very, very excited that she's joining the reading group. I think she will be of great benefit to us. Um, and yeah, we're super excited um, about reading all those books. As I often say, very often, a lot of people ha have read Rabbi Sachs on the Parsha, because that's easy. You pick it up, you read Covenant and Conversation. But once you've read, and I, I'm sure everyone here who's been in Rabbi Sachs last year will agree, once you really understand and get to grips with his philosophy, then even the Pasha stuff that you're reading takes a different dimension because you're understanding it from a different perspective. So I'm really excited that you'll be doing that with us. Okay, Robin. Robin, unmute yourself, please. Okay. Hi, I'm Robin. I'm from Renana. I've been to, I took Tanya's class the last two years. So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I'm back this year. Excellent. We're glad to have you back. Thank you. Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Kalodny from Ranana. I've also taken the classes in the past two years. Uh, love all the discussion uh, among the group and really looking forward to, to learning some more. Excellent. We're glad to have you as well. Debbie. Hi, I'm Debbie Zahavi from um, for Saba. Um, I read, uh, I'm fascinated by Rav Zak's uh, Parshat Shavua. That right now is my, I wouldn't say my intellectual level, but that's what I have been, uh, have been open to. Um, and I decided to take the class because I've heard about Tanya from my very, very dear friend, Nomi Spanglet, that you're ah, a wonderful lecturer. I didn't know Nomi was your friend. So, ah. Yes, yes. So, um, I'm, and it also fit in the time slot, so everything just fit in perfectly. Amazing. Comes from Mamash, wow. So nice to have you with us. Thank so you. I'm, Excellent. I'm, I need a little bit of uh, intellectual uh, work in my head and not only, you know, worrying about what's going on in the country. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But yeah, I'm okay. really, really pleased you're with us. I'm sure you will be of great benefit to us. So thank you for being here. Matty. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Thank you, Victor, for joining so that I'm not alone here with all my girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh. I've been, you now uh, have a partner in a male partner in crime. Yeah, I, I've uh, been a time student for two, three years already, and um, I'm thinking of opening a group of Hasidei Tanya. <laughs> I um, interestingly, I, I had I, last year I was taking two other course, courses in Tanya, Chabad uh, Tanya, and. <laughs> I had my schedule was full of Tanya, Tanya, and Tanya. <laughs> so I, I'm continuing. <laughs> Thank you. You put it all in perspective. Really, we're really happy to have you back, Matty. And thank you for being the male stalwart throughout the years. <laughs> now you have Victor to join you. So there you go. Excellent. Glad to have you. Persia. Hi, um, my name's Persia. Um, Matty, just echoing what you said, my, my kids went to Chabad Gan at one point and they used to every say, Anachnu Lomdim Tanya, Anachnu Lomdim Tanya. And we always joked that, we, you know, Anachnu Lomdim Tanya. So uh, we're, we're part of that group. I've been also with Tanya for two years. Um, and I just remember before we started the second year, I was the person that said, Tanya, you know, why are we doing about Jonathan Sachs? You know, I've read most of his books, stay next to my bed every day. I think Jonathan Sachs, that's my whole outlook. So, you know, what am I going to gain from this? And while I'm here the, the third year doing Rabbi Sachs, so it definitely was a world, a worthwhile pursuit. I think I understand him better and I think I've imbibed him even more. So um, I think we, we I, you know, I would say in this time, I, I miss his voice just so much. And I know that you know, uh, you know, learning his works is helpful and it does echo within us, but just the, the sadness of missing his voice at this time is, is hard to bear. So. Firstly, thanks, Persia. I'm really happy to have you back in the class. And as you said, I remember you were a little bit um, ambivalent about us doing Rabbi Sachs. So I'm really happy to hear that you felt it was worthwhile. Um, 
I 100% echo everything you've said, and I've heard it so many people have messaged me in the last week. I cannot even tell you how many saying how much they miss Rabbi Sachs's voice. I want to share with you today something that he wrote, or it's what specifically I want to share with you. Dafka he wrote in 2015, but it's as if he's writing it today, and I hope it will give you all a little bit of chizuk. We're going to do that shortly, um, but you're right. His voice is definitely lacking, and we all feel it desperately. Um, Tammy. Hi, Bokotov. Um, also, just, you know, echoing exactly what you just said, Tanya, and what Persia said. Um, I've been in the class for one year, but um, I have to just say is that I, I thought I left my future tense copy in um, when we were away in the summer. And the minute I got back from the summer, and I couldn't find it because I was looking for something. I ordered another one. And um, then I found my old one. But either way, I had two copies at least to, you know, share with my husband that in this time we could go back to passages and read things that we needed right now because that voice is so missing. Um, but the other just anecdote is that I'm so happy to be on my own Zoom because I've been on Zoom for Gan, I've been on Zoom for Kita Gimel, I've been on Zoom for Kita Vav, Kita Zion. Yeah. And this is my hour, so thank you. Yes, I totally hear that. I totally hear that, Tammy. I think we all agree with you. Uh, Michelle, even though you're written as iPhone. Um, I'm mute, Michelle. I'm mute. Can't hear you. Michelle, I'm mute. Hello. Yeah. No, you're still on mute. Hold on. I'll see if I can do it. One second. No, I can't unmute you. Okay, we're going to come back to you in a second. Let's do Reba in the meantime while you work out how to unmute. Reba. Ah. First of all, um, <clears throat> good morning to all. I'm the I'm the elder statesman of the class. I'm there as the as the joker, the joker out. The truth of the matter is, I knew the Sachs family rather well. They were very good friends with my parents, so I've known John. I knew Johnny from practical birth right the way through, and um, I've also been doing this for two years and. Um, I'm fascinated because I've gone to other things as a result of reading some of these books. And that's what's fascinating um, that you, for instance, um, Mr. Murray, who is all over the place at the moment, it's interesting because he was a friend of um, Jonathan Sachs. So there's all different people who you learn from because he was so literate, um, 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 Rabbi Sachs that it's very interesting to go and read other people as a result it's fascinating it still remains fascinating the only thing that's not fascinating is going to Renana from Petah Tikva in the morning but never mind we will try and keep it up you're gonna try you're gonna try Reba we're all counting on you when you're not in class we miss you and um everyone's nodding you see not just me and I will say that what one thing you said which I think is super important and and as someone mentioned here I mean I, I I'm not gonna um start tr blowing my own trumpet because it's it's really not to do with me at all but I was somehow put on the sax scholar um group and over the last um since the summer when we had our first retreat it's a group of people who are called SAC Scholars. Um, we had a retreat in the summer. And since then, we've had a very, very active WhatsApp group, which has been phenomenal, fascinating and, and uplifting and everything else. And one of the things that keeps coming back with a lot of people who are not all of the SAC Scholars are necessarily um, embedded in his books and his writing. Some of them are coming from all different places. But those, are, those that are more academic, one of the things they all say, and this is what you said, Reba, is that what they miss about Rabbi Sachs's books that aren't coming out anymore is not even just what Rabbi Sachs said, but is the footnotes, is the referrals, is what was he reading? And one of the questions we kept asking during the treat is, what would Rabbi Sachs have been reading at the moment? What book would Rabbi Sachs have enjoyed, right? And all of us are trying to think about the books that Rabbi Sachs would have been grappling with. Now, I want to tell you between you and me, and this is a, a very personal kind of private anecdote, each of us... Um, have to take on a project. I'm not going to tell you what projects I've taken on because it's my mush in the pipelines and there's a lot still to think about. And I don't know, I hope it will come to fruition. I'm not 100% sure. But one of the things, one of the project, one thing, the project that I'm thinking of um, will, um, one of the things I will be doing is interviewing some high ranking people and high 
uh, ranking's not the right, right word, uh, high profile people. And I had a fascinating discussion with Joanna, who was Rabbi Sachs's PA. She knew everything and anything about Rabbi Sachs. She knew his schedule back to front. She still does. She's unbelievable. She's taken the Rabbi Sachs legacy, Joanna ben And she's my mush, like, she's just run with it. And I spoke to her and I gave her like one idea. And I said to one of the people that I want to speak to about the book Future Tense was Dara Horn. Now, Dara Horn, if you remember, Dara Horn wrote the book People Love Dead Jews. Those of you that wrote the, I wrote something immediately after everything came out on Sunday and Monday. Now I can't even write anything. I feel like my language and my speech has gone into exile. That's how I feel at the moment. Somehow, for some reason, I was able to get something out. And I wrote on the Times of Israel, I titled it People Love Jews. Uh, People Love Dead Jews. I used use Dara Horn's title. Um, and then I had like a counter title to it. Um, and Joanna ben said to me, and this was so fascinating. She goes, Tanya, I want you to know. She, I had no idea. She goes, you would not have known this. She said, but just before Rabbi Sachs was going to die, because I said to her, I think that Rab- I can hear the dialogue between Rabbi Sachs and Dara Horn. I can hear it. I can hear the dialogue. Rabbi Sachs, future tense, which we're going to talk about soon. And, and Dara Horn, people love dead Jews, who only Dara Horn's book really focuses on this idea that everyone wants to kill Jews. And she brings in all different stories, random stories about Jews that are dead. And she essentially says the world loves their Jews. And her story is very much about anti-Semitism. By the way, state of Israel is not mentioned once in her book, which is shocking in my mind. OK, and Joanna ben said to me that before Rabbi, just before Rabbi Sex passed away, he had been planning to do a conversation with Dara Horn. OK, and I like fell on, fell backwards because I said to her, I knew it. I just knew it. When I read Dara Horn, I knew that I, they were having a conversation. And more than that, he said that Dara Horn never, ever does anything for free, like meaning she always takes uh, honorarium for what she does. But with Rabbi Sachs, she was like, jumped at the chance. Obviously, it didn't materialize. But my point is that exactly what you said, Reba, for me personally, as much as missing Rabbi Sachs's voice, it's missing knowing what to read. What was he reading? What were his sources? What was he, what was by his bedside table at night? And that is what is chaser. That's what for me is lacking as much as his voice is lacking. But his voice, I feel we can still get from his books, which is the aim of this reading group, to really take his books and understand how they apply to us today. So you are 100% right. Um, Michelle. Yeah, hi. Hi, yes, Michelle Avenari from Ranana. Um, you know, when you're one of the last to be introduced, so everything has actually been said. Um, but yeah. yes, um, moreover than these times, we really need Jonathan Sachs. And like everybody has said, all the time in my brain, when I, something's happening or something, I keep on thinking to myself, oh, like, what would he say? And um, and actually, m- much what we learned has now, come, you know, it just come into my brain, like little, little things. Um, like, for instance, which I was actually very lucky a um, few months before he passed away, but we didn't know he was ill. I, w- I went to hear I was in London and I just happened to there was somebody who had a free ticket. And I went to hear because he came out with his book launch of morality and I went to hear him. Yeah. And um, and so then you like just think all the time of morality, like, you know, how it's lacking um, in this world today. And um, and then he also brought about how in the end, like this um, in England somewhere, this in a, a community, how they got together because they had to build, I think it was um, fix a roof of a church or something. And as a community, how people came and helped. And that's amazing what we see here in Israel, that part of it, that how people are getting yeah. together. Um, so I'm what I'm saying is that in this last um, this last almost two weeks now, so like every day that goes by, the little quotes keep on coming into my brain about um things that he said and yes moreover we so need we need him now and um just to get up and to tell the world the way he would have said it eloquently and um and people listen to him that was what was unbelievable about him the world did listen to him for every you know every sector every religion every and um yeah we need him more than ever so Good yes, sense. so I'm very thankful for this for this course because um especially now this year more um over have um boys and son um three boys two son in laws in the army and um so it's tough times and so I need I need to hear his voice so thank you.
Good, I know. Um, obviously, we'll we'll talk in a minute about wishing. You know, all our learning will be obviously uh, for the school of Hatslacha uh, and Rufua and Hatslarav with the Khatfim and everything else. But yeah, a hundred percent. I think what you're saying also about the home we built together, which was uh, was that I think that was the last book that we did together. The home we built together was that right? Was that the last book we did together? Was it Future Tense? We started, we started, we started, we started Future, future tense. tense. We started the Future Tense. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we didn't finish Future Tense. Not at all. No, I did. Oh, okay. I thought we finished Future Tense. Okay. We read like about um, so, uh, two, three uh, chapters. That's it. Okay. So so the home we built together is was basically his yacht site, which is actually coming up on the 3rd of November. I was meant to be going to speak in England as a scholar and residence. I'm not sure that's going to happen um, for his yacht site. So his yacht site is the 3rd of November. And they've, they've, the theme that they've given to Rabbi Sachs' yacht site is the home we built together. And it's just so fascinating. And I think so I think about this all the time. One of the reasons they chose the home we built together was because it applies to all different societies. It can apply to Britain. It can really they were the reason they chose it was because they felt that the Jewish people needed it. The Jewish people needed the message of the home we built together, which is essentially the idea of creating a covenantal society, a covenantal society where if you remember what Rabbi Sachs says, it's not just looking to the government to solve our problems, it's about us creating the institutions and the um, the infrastructure within society itself for us to work covenantally. And what what the legacy trust felt was that the Jewish people at, the, at this moment, and especially in Israel, didn't have that. And what is so phenomenal is in the two weeks that we've just had leading up to Rabbi Sachs's your time, what we have proven beyond all doubt is that the covenantal society is still, that civility, as Rabbi Sachs calls it in his book, The Home We Build Together, is still alive and kicking. And I have to tell you that that, was the, that is the only thing at the moment that is keeping me going. I, honestly, the only thing that's keeping me going is knowing that we have, and we're going to talk about this as well, we have almost once again aligned ourselves and 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 said yes to the covenant of fate. Remember, we spoke all the time about how influential Rabbi Sachs, uh, how influential Rav Soloveitchik's idea of fate and, and, and destiny was on Rabbi Sachs. Those of you that weren't with us last year, we're going to go over that again. And to me, what the Jewish people today have, have literally cried out and said is we are still part of this covenant of fate. And they have we have rebuilt literally in two weeks. It's unbelievable. We have rebuilt that infrastructure of covenantal society. So I think that that is just phenomenal. And I 100 percent identify what you're saying, Michelle, that I really hear the home we build together keeps coming back to me again and again. Alyssa. Can I, can I just. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't. On. I don't. The, the the beauty of it is, I don't think it took two weeks. It was literally like straight away from go. Well, I'm saying no. I'm it, saying in the last yeah. two weeks we've seen it. Yeah. But you're right. From the beginning, a hundred percent. Not even a question. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, just even the images of these kids. You know, I we always used to complain in this class. I have, by the way, as the last few weeks were unfolding, I kept thinking about our discussions in this class, which is why I asked you to bring future tense, which we're going to get to. I kept thinking about discussions we had last year in this class. Also about how harsh we were often about the younger generation and how we said that the younger generation doesn't have the same amount of loyalty necessarily, doesn't have the same ideological drive as as the older generations or certainly the generations the Khalut Sim had. And I have to tell you that we've all been proven wrong. Look at those kids who were in India and this and then and, and they have come and they have run back to Israel. And I even look at my um, my daughters in the army, but I look at my next daughter down, who's two years, all of her age group, who are two two years or a year till they get to the army or till they get to, to their Sherut. And they have not stopped with all of the various, uh, the hit nadvot, volunteering and doing this. And they are 100% dedicated to Am Yisrael, to Eretz Yisrael. It's, and for me, that has been, the, that's the only thing that's been keeping me going. And honestly, when I can't sleep at night and I've had like no sleep for the lot, I'm sure all of you as well, I just cannot sleep. I like in the day I'm running, I'm doing another and then at night, all of a sudden it hits you and that anxiety starts. And that is like, that is my calming thought. That is like the only thing that's keeping me calm. So yeah, it's amazing. And I keep thinking back to our discussions and saying we underestimated, we were wrong. We underestimated that generation. Alyssa. Uh, hi, Elisa Gellis. I live in Netanya. Um, I've also been doing the class for the last two years. And I think, um, you know, the first year when we were reading a lot of different books, um, that was fascinating on one level. And then when you shifted over to just doing Rabbi Sachs, I feel like it's just been um, a person you've been able to give us a perspective 
on him. Like, you know, everybody sees him on Instagram and you see all of his messages and whatever, but being able to really read the books, I feel has really enabled us on another level <clears throat> to understand um, his process, um, to understand, you know, also just having the background of the time period that he wrote each book in and knowing what was going on in history at that time. And just, um, it's just been unbelievable. And by, by the way, just so you know, you, you mentioned Dara Horn. And, you know, my youngest daughter is in high school in America. And actually, the, the book club book that um, the Parents Association was meant to be reading this week was this book. And but on, but they canceled the session, which I thought was so interesting. So wow. it, was the opposite, it was the opposite response to what you were saying. I think maybe just the title was too was too difficult cool. to do. Yeah. But I thought that was really, really interesting um, that that they that they chose this book for now. Um, and it does bring back the point because you do always I mean, even in your other classes, you're always bringing up books that kind of bring full circles to what's going on in the world. So I feel like learning Rabbi Sachs really enables us to have a greater understanding of what's going on in the world around us. And I, I really, really um, thank you for that. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Alyssa. Miriam. Unmute, Miriam. We can't hear you. Miriam? Unmute. Unmute. I got it. I got it. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I joined the class halfway through the year last year, and it's been um, very enlightening and, and inspirational, and I I'm very happy for the discussion and the time to learn and grow with this group of women. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam. You've been phenomenal. We've loved having you in the class. Okay. Uh, Fremet. Fremet, Dina, and Carol, I can't see you, but I'm presuming you're there. And Dina, I'm super excited to see you. Dina, you want to open up first? Dina? Oh, hey, unmute. Hi, Carol. Dina, unmute. We can hear you. Okay, I unmuted. I don't know what the I'm, I came late, so I've missed what we're supposed to say. What we're talking about? Oh no, we're just introducing ourselves. Oh, okay. Say and to say whether we've been in the course in the previous years or not. Oh, okay. I'm Dina. Um, I was in the course last year, and um, I loved it. And I'm back. I haven't signed up, but I'm going to. I've even started reading the book. <laughs> wow, we're very excited. I thought you weren't going to be signing up because you said you started working, or whatever. But we're super excited. You're back in the yeah, class. I'm Excellent. I can I can work it out. Amazing. Well, we'll be very excited to have you. Thank you Thank for, you. for, Thanks, for coming. Jim. Carol, hi. Hi. Um, I just tuned in. I got here late. I'm really sorry. Um, oh, good. But I've always been a big fan of Rabbi Sachs and his way of thinking about things. Um, and so I missed all the other classes. This is my first time. So I'm really excited to just really just listen and see what kind of discussions go on amongst everybody read the books and uh so thank you i live in renata and i attend excellent uh, pond in renata excellent yes you've been to my other classes some of them so it's great to have you in this class i'm sure you will be of great benefit um and yeah just as long as everyone you know reads the books keeps up to date comes to as many classes as you possibly can obviously if you have to miss a class here or there it's not the end of the world but we really would love for people to try and dedicate themselves to this class um and yeah when you feel you're ready to participate in the discussion which i'm sure will be soon everyone is always welcome from it Fremet, are you with us? Okay, I'll introduce Fremet. I don't know if she can hear. Fremet's been in our class from the beginning, the last three, two years. Um, she is a stalwart and she is always... <laughs> ah, Fremet, I'm introducing you. Yeah, no, I, I just, uh, it's a bit, no, it's, <laughs> yeah, no, I love the class and I love Jonathan Sachs. It's like a voice of reason in this mad world. But I'm in Kako at the moment because my son-in-law has been called up and I have a daughter about to have a baby. and. Um, I hope I can keep up with the course this year. Yeah, I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Yeah. All of us are, are really in the in the point of chaos at the moment. And I know it's really difficult for us to even think ahead and a day ahead, never mind a week ahead or a month ahead. But we will all try as much as we can. And we're happy that you're with us. After. Yeah, but thank you, Tanya. Yeah. 
And and perhaps Lacha, you should uh, your son in law should be safe and your daughter should be well. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay, let's let's see how we can Arthur. Get be with us. I've got to work hey, well, I'm, to I'm, uh, I'm here. But um Gil is gonna uh, I'm not at home, so I'm I'm joining from uh, just going davening, uh, but we're planning to take the class. And uh, Gil is not feeling so well this morning, but uh, I could say we're planning to take the class. But if I can get her to come in in a few in about fifteen minutes. Okay. okay. All right. Great. So when you and Gilla can come in, that's great. You'll always be welcome. Um, and we're excited that you're you're back with us. All right. I'm looking Thanks, forward to uh, it. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Right. Okay. okay. So what? Hold on. Yeah. Arthur, we just mute. Excellent. Okay. So let's jump in. What I want to do is first and foremost, I I I have generally in my classes, I've given a bit of a background as to, I guess try and understand what's going on, give a slight slant onto the situation. Um, I don't want to share so much of that. I don't want to waste too much of our time on it, but I do want to share with you, and I, I did send it. Oh, uh, I need to be able to share screen. Hold on. Who's there from Matan that can help me share screen? Who's the host? Matana Sharon. Tanya, I'll Sippy? Sure. No, no, it's fine. I've been like, trying to message you in the background. I'm co-host. I can't give you that either, but I'll ask her to make you host. Yeah, that's fine. That's okay. fine. Who is it? Sippy? No, it's Michelle. I'm going to message her. Uh, gonna... Okay, so just ask her to make me co-host. Okay, in the meantime, I, in the meantime, it's fine because I'll, I'll I'll just explain what I'm what I'm thinking. So, first and foremost, I, I want to say the following thing. I'm I'm like I'm amazed that so many of you are here with me on the Zoom. I I have to be honest. My head is, and I'm sure all of you is all over the place. Um, and the thought of even coming into a Zoom that isn't mine, that is teaching is difficult. So I'm like really thankful and grateful, genuinely grateful to all of you for coming in because as much as I said to Oshra asked me right at the beginning to speak on one of the evenings, I think it was on the Sunday night even, or the Monday, no, it was the Monday night. And she said to me, will you speak? Will you give words of chizuk? And I said to Oshra, how can I give words of chizuk if I need chizuk myself? I can't be that words of chizuk. She goes, I know you'll find the right words. And the truth is that I said to her afterwards that as much as you know, people saying you gave chizuk. Actually, it was me that got chizuk just from seeing so many people together, everyone looking and searching for some meaning. So again, not that I'm a person to give chizuk to any of you, but what's been going on on my head so much over the last um, over the last few weeks is I feel like a lot's been broken, and as much as like the brokenness of obviously the pain and the terrible, terrible things, tragedies, atrocities that we've seen. I also feel there's a bit of a brokenness in my narrative. Um, and that for me has been very overwhelming, I'll be honest. Um, all of you know, and we've been learning over the last year or two, Rabbi Sachs's narrative, and I, and I really feel that, you know, the narrative of future tense. And now that I'm speaking to you, I'm thinking, even though I had said to you that the first book we're going to do is The Great Partnership, I do feel that it really would be productive and actually supremely important for us to go back to future tense before we go to The Great Partnership, because the book that keeps coming back to me is Future Tense. When we read Future Tense of Rabbi Sachs, there was this narrative there of we're in a time where we've got our own land, where we're safe, where we've got an army, where we have strength. We don't need to adopt this anti-Semitic narrative where we're the weak people, where we're, you know, the people in distress, where we need other people for our own survival. And I have to be honest, when I read that and, and we had this discussion in the class and I said, I really align myself with Rabbi Sachs's thinking. And in the last two weeks, I'll be totally honest, I feel as if that narrative and that way of thinking, for me at least, has fragmented. And I, I'm struggling. I'm, I, I'm, I'm really struggling. Now, on the one hand, there's a part of me that's ambivalent because I still believe in what Rabbi Sachs says and I still believe in our koach and in our strength and in us being strong and everything else. But the images that we're seeing and the fact that we we mamash failed to understand the strength of Hamas and what they wanted, to me, that is also very, very intense. So there feels as if there's this fracture that's happening. And I kept thinking to myself that Hamas are, there's no two ways about it. Hamas are modern day Amalek. 
They came, they attacked from behind, they attacked the weak. They had no sense of ethic or morals or anything close to it. And I kept thinking about Amalek and I went back to the very first time Amalek attacks the people of Israel, which is after they've come out of, of Mitzrayim and they are wandering in the Midbar. And just before Amalek comes, we see that it, the place is called Meimariva because they were arguing with God. Well, they argued with God. And but there's more than just the argument with God. There seems to be chaos. There seems to be the main is this place of chaos, this place of argumentation, this place where nobody has trust in anybody else. They don't have trust. They don't have immun. They don't have trust in themselves. They don't have trust in God. They don't have trust in the other person. And I kept thinking to myself, and again, it we're far from um, applying any theological reasoning category meaning to these events. I think we are far away from doing that. But just for my own sake, I kept thinking about Amalek and I kept thinking about the fact that there was a fragmentation in Israel. There was a, some kind of chaotic argumentation that was happening before Amalek strikes them. And then Amalek comes and strikes them. And, and this to me was the key. I kept looking and searching, how do we beat Amalek? How does the Torah tell us to be Amalek? So there's two main sources that I'm, I, I keep drawing from. One is the first battle with Amalek, and the second is the last battle of Amalek in the Torah, which is a Megillah Estel. And both of those battles with Amalek, in my mind, give us some insight, some framework, some window into understanding how we can battle them. The first battle with Amalek, what did the what what are the people told to do? Yoshua is told to go and battle them on the ground, and Moshe is told to go to the top of the mountain and hold the god of the hand, the stick of God in his hand, and his hand needs to be lifted. And we're told that Aaron and Paul go at the Tamhubi Yadav, they support his hands, and when his hands are in the air, he's victorious. The people are victorious, and when his hands are down, they're not. And the Gemara asks, does his hands make or break all? Meaning, is this a miraculous event? And the Torah. And the Gemara answers, the Mishnah answers, no, it wasn't a miracle. It was very simple. When Moshe's arms were raised to heaven, the people's eyes were raised to heaven and they were victorious. And when Moshe's arms were down, the people's eyes were down and they weren't victorious. What does this mean? In modern language, it's a very, very simple word. It's morale. That's the word. When the morale of the people was high, they were victorious. And when the morale was low, they weren't. And I keep thinking all the time about Yedei Emunah. That's how the Torah describes Moshe's hands. It's a strange word in the Torah. The Torah doesn't use the word Emunah very often. And definitely it does not mean Emunah in the way that we understand Emunah today, which is like the idea of dogmatic faith. It's not dogmatic faith. It's not propositional faith, A, B, C, D. No. Yedei Emunah of Moshe really means what the hands of trust. Moshe is the covenantal hands. When the people were working through the prism of covenant, they were successful. When they weren't, they weren't. And I think that the Yedei Emunah here, to me, represents what's been happening. And that is that essentially all of us are Tom Chait. The people are on the ground that are fighting. They are Chayalim. They are with Yoshua. They're the ones fighting on the ground. But all of us, we're with Moshe. We're the Aaron and at the top of the mountain. We're holding up the hands of Yedei and Munah. We are showing the soldiers that they are supported, that we are the morale. We are showing them that this is part of a bigger picture, that we are part of a story. I read Sivan Rav Meir wrote something so beautiful the other day. Those of you that can find it on her Instagram or Facebook, she wrote that there was an interview with two of the people that had um, survived the massacre in the at the rave, at the party in the desert. And they were sitting in the studio with a psychologist and they were telling their story. And, and then the interviewer said to the psychologist, you know, what is the best way of grappling with this unprecedented tragedy and the psychologist said you have to keep telling the story that is you tell the story from the beginning what happened go through it what happened on the day even for us even for us and we were, were nowhere near those events but for us to tell the story what happened that day why because story has a beginning a middle and an end and we have to know that they will have an end and i kept thinking about what rabbi Sachs speaks about in all his books if you remember over the last year but 
all his books, he speaks about the idea of how important the story is for our identity. To tell a story is what gives us our identity, what gives us the bigger picture. And that to me is the day of Moshe. When the people look up to heaven, they're not just looking up to God, they're looking up to something that's bigger than themselves. The understanding that they're part of a story that's bigger than themselves and there will be a middle and an end and there will be an end to this terrible time and we will integrate that story into our story. The story of the people of Israel, the never ending story of the people of Israel. And I really, I really think that that to me is what the, the fighting Amalek is about, that we are together, that there's people at the top of the mountain that are the supporters and there's people on the ground that are fighting, but we have to always have our eyes up to heaven to know that there is something bigger here. So that's the first thing. The second thing to me was the story of Esther. If we think about what was going on at the time, the Jewish people, a lot of the Jewish people in uh, where, where they were in Persia were very, very apathetic to Judaism. We see a lot of them went to Ahasuerus's feast and had had negated their Jewish identity. And there was almost this apathy that people were hiding their Jewish identity, much like Esther does. And at the point when there is the Xerah and the, the decree that the people, Jewish people are going to die, Mordechai, who never gave up on his Jewish identity, goes, he tears his... Uh, 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 close and he goes out and he screams a scream and then he goes to Esther and he says to Esther this is what's happening I need you to help and Esther essentially issues her Jewish identity her role and she says no I haven't been called to the the, the, the I haven't been called for 30 days to the palace I can't go I, t- I can't go to the king I'll, I'll be killed and Mordecai turns around to her and says to her im le'et who knows if for this reason you came to kinship and all the time I'm thinking I'm thinking also about so many other people also in Khotlaret people who are influential influencers Jewish influencers who haven't put their voice out who haven't said what's going on all of us have a role to play and then Mordechai turns around to her and says to her um um if you close your ears, if you block yourself off, if you say, oh, it's not my responsibility, I'm not part of the Jewish people, meaning if you negate the covenant of fate, if you say, I'm not fated to be with, I'm not part of the Jewish people, I promise you, says Mordechai, the people of, the people of Israel, this is not the end of their story. They will be saved. This is not the end of the story, but you and your family, you won't be part of that saving because you didn't take responsibility for being part of the Jewish people. And at that moment, Esther realizes, and what does she say? And this is the key. She says, I'll go and do my job. I'll go and do what I need to do because I know that I'm in the role that I need to do it. But go and gather all the Jews. All of the Jews need to come together because without unity, Anyone else's role isn't going to work. Everyone has a role to play, but we have to play it in a unified way. And to me, that is the message of, of what's going on. And now that's that's what's ringing in my head. That's what I feel is what's happening. And we've proven that is what we've been doing. And I want to share with you a couple of things that Rabbi Sachs um, said. Hold Can on a second. Sorry. Of course. Can I interrupt you just for once? Yes, sec. yes, yes, yes. And yes, I yes, apologize yes. for this, but... I'm wondering that you use the the story of Esther, but I'm wondering if the story of Samuel and Amalek is much more pertinent at this point. Because Explain. the one thing about the story of Samuel, which is the story we're all trying to now, we don't know what to do because we we feel that humanity is so important. But what does he what does he t- make sure with Shaul? that we have to blot them out. Those people that are evil have to be blotted out. And all of us have got a problem here because we've seen what what uh, what, what these people have done. But on the other hand, there are, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people. What are we meant to do as humans? Can we do this? And yet Samuel turns around to Shaul and says, yeah. Have to block them out because if you don't, they'll come back and they'll come back. And it's it's an interesting story. So we've spoken a lot over the years, Reba, when we've been looking at Rabbi Saxon, even yeah. in the first year when we were looking yeah. at the philosophy books, about this very, very narrow um path kind of dialectic between human values, between humanism. Very difficult. I find it humanism very difficult and, and one of the things that we brought up by the way in the past is the issue of Amalek we have brought it up and we have questioned it and I think for the first time ever even the most humanist of Jewish people are beginning to kind of understand 
what is going on in the Torah. Now, I'm not, again, I, I, don't, I don't want to speak too politically at, at this stage in our course. No, I don't Once mean Once we all get to know each I... other too more, we will. But I, my point is, and I I hear what you're saying, Reba, you're, 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 you're kind of framing for us the, the dilemma. And it's, it's a huge terrible, dilemma. Huh? It's a huge dilemma. I think and and, and I have people. to be honest, I thank God that I'm not in a position of leadership that I have to make those choices. Um, I just pray to God that our leaders have the wisdom and insight to be able to make the right choices. Um, but but I agree, I agree, it's a huge dilemma. And and you're right to bring in the example of Shaul and uh and, and Amalek, and I and I think it's important. Um, I want to just share with you. Um, a couple of Rabbi Sachs's things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so firstly, those of you that remember when we did Radical Then, Radical Now, Rabbi Sachs, what is, and we're going to see it in a minute, one of the one of the turning points in Rabbi Sachs's biography, biographical trajectory, is when he um, is a student at Cambridge during the Six Day War. And at that moment, he, everything changes for him. And he says, he talks about the fact that, you know, he was just a student, that came from a traditional Jewish background, nothing particularly, you know, he wasn't invested in Judaism in the way, for sure, not in the way he was afterwards. And at, in 1967, all of a sudden, it looked as if the state of Israel was going to fall. And he said it was unbelievable. People came out the woodwork, people he didn't even know were Jewish in Cambridge, praying for the state, claiming their Jewish identity, reclaiming their Jewish identity. And listen to what he says here. I, I think it's so beautiful. He says, but I had witnessed something in those days and weeks that didn't make sense in the rest of my world. It had nothing to do with politics or war or even prayer. It had to do with Jewish identity. Collectively, the Jewish people had looked in the mirror and said, we are still Jews. And by that, they meant more than a private declaration of faith, religion in the conventional sense of the word. It meant that they felt part of the people, involved in its fate, implicated in its destiny, caught up in its tragedy, exhilarated by its survival. I have felt it. So had every other Jew I knew. Why? The Israelis were not people I knew. They were neither friends nor relatives in any literal sense. Israel was a country 2,000 miles away, which I had visited once, but in which I had no plans to live. Yet I had no doubt that their danger was something I felt personally. It was then that I knew that being Jewish was not something private and personal, but something collective and historical. It meant being part of an extended family, many of whose members I did not know, but to whom I nonetheless felt connected by bonds of kinship and responsibility. And listen to what he says here. He says, it made no sense at all in the concepts and categories of the 1960s. That was when I realized that being Jewish was an exceptionally odd thing to be structurally odd. Jewish identity was not simply a truth or a set of truths I could accept or reject. It was a, not a preference I could express or disavow. It was not a faith I could adopt or, left, or leave alone. I had not chosen it. It had chosen me. And I really, really feel, I'm going to skip a bit now, but I really feel that that is what's happened in the last two weeks, that people have suddenly realized I'm Jewish. And actually, I have no choice. However much the Israeli says, oh, I'll be so much better off somewhere else, right? Oh, I may as well go and move to Australia. And I have voices, I have friends, Israeli friends who have said to me in the past, but I think there's something about the fact that they realize that it's not something they choose, it actually chooses them. And they are bound to it, like Rav Soloveitchik says, in this like this like threads of 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 binding that you you can't get out of you you just can't it doesn't add up logically that's what he speaks what's what he speaks about um without any conscious decision i was reminded that merely by being born into the jewish people i was enmeshed in a network of relationships that connect connected me to other people other places other times i belong to a people and being part of a people i belong Okay, and then he continues and, and, and speaks about this idea of being part of the Torah scroll, which I know we all remember, um, and saying that we're not free floating atoms, right? We're part of a letter in a scroll and we've got a commitment to the story of our people. But now I want to share with you something profound. As I said, I'm part of the Sachs scholars, and one of the things they sent on the group was a Facebook post that Rabbi Sachs wrote, a Facebook post, but they've now posted it. I can send you the link actually, they've now posted it to his website. There's a Facebook post he wrote in October 2015 when people were asking him to respond to what was happening, all the terror that was happening in Israel. And listen to what he writes. It's as if he's writing it for us today. He says, what do you do when terror strikes, when all sense of security is lost, when you feel self-surrounded by hate, when the voice of reason is drowned out by the clamor of rage and when all hope for the future seems lost and the world around you has turned dark? That, they told me, is how it has felt to be in Israel these past few weeks and days and weeks. As I heard, and as I heard the anxiety and even despair in their voice, 
or thought of all those lacerating words from the book of Psalms. From the depths I have called to you, O Lord, I am a peace, but whenever I speak it, they are for war. O my God, why have you forsaken me? I heard an echo of King David's sense of betrayal, said rashly, all people are liars. And there are other words that can help us make the journey from darkness to, are there other words that can help us make the journey from darkness to light? And as I was listening, I suddenly felt a voice as if from the collective unconscious of our people saying, we are on Israel. The descendants, not just of Abraham, the iconoclast, and Isaac, the almost sacrificed child, but especially of Jacob, Israel, because Jacob had one extraordinary strength of character, which he endowed us, his children. Jacob was the person whose deepest encounters with God took place when he was alone at night, far from home, and fleeing from one danger to the next. That was when he had a vision of a ladder stretching from earth to heaven and said, truly, the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. This is the man who, under almost identical circumstances many years later, wrestled at night with an angel and was told his name would be changed to Israel, meaning one who wrestles with God and with man and prevails. Jacob never lived in peace, but somehow he took all the fear and pain and loneliness and isolation and turned them into a vision of heaven and found God in the very midst of that place a moment of danger. Jacob was the man who rescued hope from the depths of despair, who kept going despite his fear of Esau and Lavan, despite even the loss of his beloved son, Yosef, and who never stopped wrestling with history and destiny. This is the man who somehow endowed us, his descendants to the end of time, with an inner strength that is almost beyond belief. Ours is the people that empires tried to destroy, yet we outlived them. All the people often hated, but who did not repay hate with hate, and instead of cursing the darkness, lit a light that became an eternal flame. This is why the Jewish people became the voice of hope in the conversation of humankind in generation after generation, and a compelling testimony to the power of life to defeat the forces of darkness and death. To be a Jew in whom beats the spirit of our ancestors and the hope of generations to come is to feel the pain and yet carry on, to know fear and to refuse to be intimidated to be surrounded by hate and yet to have the courage not to answer it with hatred in return. These are among the supreme achievements of the human spirit, and it is to them that we are being summoned now by every syllable of our history. The fear is real, the pain is deep, and yet the faith that carried our ancestors will carry us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death into the light of the promised future that still awaits us, when in anguish people will finally know peace, the last of all our blessings, but still the greatest, speedily in our days. This is the moment where prayers of all Jews, like a single person with a single heart, are with the people of Israel in the land of Israel, and the people in the land that give us so much strength and pride. Let us be strong and strengthen one another until the city whose name means peace at last comes a true home of peace with you, with you, with all my heart, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. And so I think that it's a, it's a really incredible message. And if you remember, he speaks in other places about Yaakov and what the name of Yaakov is. And here he really kind of expresses that to do with our reality. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, I want to now go and give a short, brief introduction to Rabbi Sachs. We're not going to go through everything. I know we did this last year um, also, and the, but there's new people this year. And I want us to understand Rabbi Sachs, the man, before we engage with Rabbi Sachs, the philosopher, and Rabbi Sachs, the rabbi, the theologian, however you want to term him, we have to understand a little bit about his background. Now, again, there's many people, there's some people here that were bought brought up and born in London, in England, they understand kind of the British, British jury and where Rabbi Sachs came from. There's many here that weren't. Um, and we, last year, we got some nice um, uh, uh, backgrounds and kind of um, it, it, personal reflections by Reba, who also was very close with his family. And I think it's important for us to understand the background of what England you know, the, of, of Britain, of England, of the kind of jury that exists in England. It's not like America. It's not the same. Jury in England, and specifically where Rabbi Jonathan Sachs came from, was very much um, a tradition. There was a very strong traditional jury there, which means it wasn't reform and it wasn't, there was reform and conservative there as well. But the, from where Rabbi Sachs came from, it was kind of a very traditional outlook. And I have to tell you that even my my sister and brother-in-law, um, who, who live in England still, um, part of the United Synagogue, um, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, my husband's um, sister, brother-in-law, um, and they are part of a community in Radler, and they still very, very much are 100% loyal Jews. They are very much involved in the synagogue, in the shul. They're very much involved. 
but they are not necessarily Shomrei Shabbat, they're not necessarily Shomrei even Kashrut, but they very much identify with their Jewish background, with their Jewish tradition, with the Jewish institutions, they send their children to Jewish schools. Okay, so we have to understand that this is kind of where Rabbi Sachs was coming from originally. Hey, okay, his um father was um worked in the East End, where my father, um Zichunal Livracha, also worked in, in, in Brick Lane, selling schmatter, selling uh, uh material. And um his his parents gave him a traditional background, but as he says in his own words, they weren't particularly academic, they weren't particularly intellectual, but they gave him a very, very strong grounding. And what I want to show you is we're gonna, I'm gonna share with you now just an outline of Rabbi Sachs's life, try and understand a little bit about who he was and where he came from, in order for us to really understand also a lot of his writings and a lot of where he's coming from. I want to begin with two beautiful quotes. <clears throat> the first comes. Actually, not sure exactly where it comes from. I'm not sure where I found it, but this is what he says about the Torah. He says, "So long as the Jewish people never stop learning, the Jewish heart will never stop beating. Never has a people loved a book more. Never has a book sustained a people longer and lifted it higher." A rabbi says, "Very much believed in using the Torah as the basis to his theology." And we're going to look at this as we go. Many, many of his books from. The earliest books like Tradition and Traditional Age and Arguments for the Sake of Heaven, in those books, he's much more academic. And by the way, they're all being republished, which is super exciting. OK, they're all being republished. All of those books are more academic. They're more Rabbi Sachs, the scholar. He's not necessarily writing to the layperson. In all of those books, he's bringing in still a lot of Torah sources, a lot of sources from the Talmud. As his books become more geared towards the lay people, starting with his book, A Letter in the Scroll, in America it's called Letter in the Scroll, in England it's called Radical Then, Radical Now, that book is really geared towards the lay person. And in that book, again, he uses the Midrash of the Burning Palace as the basis to his arguments in, this, in that book, the arguments about the problem of evil and really the agenda of the book, Radical Then, Radical Now, which is essentially why be Jewish? Why should I be a Jew? So that's one book that has another book, for example, that we're going to be doing this year, okay, which is um, uh, not in the name of God. Okay, in that book, he really is, it's almost a hermeneutical unpacking of Torah texts. He brings in the texts of Yosef and his brothers and Esau and Yaakov, and he uses them as texts in order to bring out a certain theological message. So for Rabbi Sachs, we have to understand that the underpinning is the text, is the narratives, is the Torah narratives. Those Torah narratives, we just saw it now. When he gave a message to the people of Israel in 2015, he uses the Torah narrative of Yaakov as a kind of, as a foundation to his general uh, outlook, to his general philosophy, to a message that he wants to impart. There's another beautiful quote, which I think is also particularly poignant for us at the moment. Again, this sheet I prepared um, a long time before I knew what was happening. Um, comes from The Great Partnership. Again, these two quotes are from The Great Partnership. This is going to be the book that we're going to be looking at. Um, I, again, as I said, I want to just go back to Future Tense for maybe one class next week. But after that, we're definitely going to be looking at The Great Partnership. The Great Partnership, he says like this, the meaning of life is the realization that you are held in the arms of a vast presence you are not abandoned, that you are here because you are meant to be. It is a sense that life is something you have been given so that you live with a feeling of gratitude and you seek to, back, to give back, to pay it forward, to be a blessing to others. This presence in which you live knows you better than you know yourself. So it's no use pretending to be what you are not or denying your shortcomings or justifying your mistakes or engaging in self-pity or blaming others. It's a loving, forgiving, but challenging presence, demanding much, but never more than you can do. It asks you to give your best, not for the sake of reward, but because that is what you are here on earth to do. And again, as I read this, I read this in, a, in another class yesterday. And as I read it, I said I had not prepared this source before everything that happened in the last two weeks, but it really gave me chizuk when he says, um, when he says something like demanding much, but never more than you can do. And I kept thinking to myself, so many of us want to do so much, but sometimes we find ourselves in these days really despairing and, and, and sometimes almost 
we feel as if we we can't move we can't do what we would like to do what we would generally have the energy to do but that's okay we can do what we can do each of us in our own realm each of us in our own you know home front as we want to call it everyone does what they want to do and we know that what we are doing we're not doing because we're going to have a reward for it we're doing it because we know that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And then the final quote I want to read is, faith is not certainty. It's the courage to live with uncertainty. Faith is never easy. The great heroes of the moral life, like the great artists and scientists and thinkers, like anyone who has undertaken to live a life of high ideals, knows failure after failure, disappointment after disappointment. What makes them great is they refused to despair. The sheer wonder that God could take the risk of creating a creature with the freedom to disobey him and wreck his world. There is no faith humans can have in God equal to the faith God must have in humankind to place us here as guardians of the vastness and splendor of the universe. I just want to stop here for a second and say one of the images that's been helping me theologically over the last two weeks has been the image from the Midrashim and the image that Elie Wiesel brings in a lot and other Holocaust theologians. And that is the image of God crying. Somehow I just feel that God is up in heaven and he's just crying. He's crying because look at what's happened. Look at what his creatures have done. And I feel as if that's the only image at the moment that's giving me comfort from the perspective of theology. Um, I remember over the many, many years I researched Holocaust theology, I used to like grapple with the image of God crying because in a sense, it kind of, for me, made God impotent. It made God passive. And somehow now in this moment, it's the only image that I feel I can align myself with, um, that God is crying with us. And I never understood why that gave Elie Wiesel comfort. And now for the first time, I, I really feel that I somehow, and I'm only speaking from my own personal perspective, you can agree or disagree, obviously, but if somehow that image is the only image that seems to give me some sense of theological comfort. And this is what Rabbi Sachs is saying here, right? That, that God had faith in us and God still has faith in us, the Jewish people. God had faith in humanity and humanity have let God down. But we, the Jewish people, we haven't. Look at what we've been doing. Look at how we've been proving to God how united we are and what strength we do have. That is why I see in the faces of those I meet a trace of God's love that lifts me and lifts me to try and love a little as God loves. I know of nothing with greater power to lift us beyond ourselves and to perform acts that carry within them a signal of transcendence. Okay. And now I want to read this with you, um, which which we haven't read before. Um, and I think it's one of, in my mind, before anyone learns any Rabbi Sachs' books, you have to read this quote. But really, I, I urge you all to, you can, on your PDFs, you can just link into this, you can click into this. It's quite long. It's one of the last appointments Rabbi Sachs had. It was one of the last meetings Rabbi Sachs had. It was with jo British journalists before he passed away. It was with British journalists. Um, and Rabbi Sachs met with them. And one of the things, one of the people asked him, you know, why you're such a prolific speaker? Why do you feel the need to also be a prolific writer? And listen to what he says. Listen to his response. He says, I'll tell you exactly why I write books. When I was a kid, I learned to speak in public. In those days, I could do it quite well. I could really move a crowd. And I thought that was the most dangerous thing I knew because you can move them to truth, but you can move them to falsehood. You can move them to love, but it is a lot easier to move them to hate. You can move them to feel threatened. You can move them to paranoia. I cannot begin to tell you how easy it is. And it made me ill. I still speak publicly, it's what I do, but I decided I'm not gonna do this any longer as the carrier of what I have to say to people. I'm going to set it out in print with sources, with footnotes, with qualifications, wherever I feel it appropriate and say, now here it is. I'm not, gonna to I'm not trying to persuade you of anything, just read it on your own and tear my arguments to shreds. That's why I wrote the book. And that is the difference between the, what the Greeks used to call philosophy and sophistry. And that's 
why I write books. Sometimes people have asked me, you know, why, why should, Rabbi Sachs is a prolific writer, but why can't I just watch his videos or why shouldn't I just read his partial stuff that's short? You know, to get into his books is hard, it's philosophical, it's sometimes difficult, who's got the patience? And I, one of my missions, my Rabbi Sachs missions, and I've said this to anyone who will listen to me from within the Rabbi Sachs cohort and, um, and the Rabbi Sachs Legacy Trust, one of my missions is to get people to engage with Rabbi Sachs's books, because I really believe after reading this even more so after hearing it, I originally heard it and I pointed it out to a few people and since then a lot of people have used it. When I heard it for the first time, I said that is Rabbi Sachs. Rabbi Sachs understood and, and we're seeing it today, seeing it in today in today's day and age. People buy into hate much more than they buy into love. Why? Because they're not educated, because they don't know anything. It's unbelievable. If you watch these videos, crazy videos of people protesting in the UK and people went up to them for Hamas and people went up to them and asked them, do you even know the situation? Do you know who Hamas are? Do you understand what they stand for? Do you understand the Israeli-Arab-Palestinian conflict? They know nothing, nothing. But they've bought into some video that they've watched or some whatever it is that they've seen. And that is the difference. And Rabbi Sachs says that's why he writes books. And I think it's it's really, really important. I'm just going to stop share for a minute to ask if there's anyone that wants to add anything at this point. Okay. Yeah, I, I've got... Matty, yeah. I've, I've got something to say. I think that maybe it could also come first. Matty, your, ver your, your sound is not great. So if you can come slightly nearer to your microphone, that would be brilliant. My, my computer is still on the desk, so that's why you hear me. Okay. Better? You hear me a little better? bit, a little bit. It's okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, last week in uh, Macquarie Shown, Rav Elchanan Mir wrote a short, a short article that says he feels that in the last year we've been split, as we described the name of Iva, we've been split as a country. Of course, we're all aware of that. And he says Hashem was letting us play around like a parent watching their young children play and fight until he got to the point where he said enough is enough. He slammed his hand on the table and he said, now we'll learn how to be together. And at that point, last Shabbat, uh, we were struck and he cried. So that's the image that we talked about. He didn't talk about Hashem crying. But that's what came to mind when I heard you speaking. So I, I think there's something that I'm going to try to find that article. I'll send it to you. Uh, another point is um, the other day I heard Micha Goodman speaking about where we are today. And he said, as you said, all of his paradigms, all of his understanding has broken. He needs to think where we are from here going forward. But I think the most important thing he said is that we as a, so as a society have lost our uh, continuity with Jewish history. And on Shabbat last week, on Simchat Torah, we had a black hole in our uh, Israeli history, where we believe going back to, he goes to Tishinev, he says, going back to those original pogroms that started Zionism, we uh, always believed that we were in Eretz Nokria, we were in, in the uh, diaspora, we had no control, but in our own state, we would always have control, and we would always be powerful and take care of our people. He says, on that one day, we did not take care of our people. So... Israel felt Jewish history repeating itself. And that's where we are today. And it puts so, us... So, so I, two things that, I, I mean, any, anyone else is also welcome to comment, but two things I want to say. Just I just say two things and then hold on. I'm going to, everyone put your hand up on the thing if you want to comment and I'll take you all. Number one, in terms of, I think it's, again, I think we have to be very, very careful about imposing theological categories onto what's happened in any event especially the whole I mean any event but this event in particular we're still in it we're still very close to it it's very difficult again everyone can say this is how I feel 
I think to say objectively, this is what God was doing is very difficult. So that's the first thing I would say. I All I keep thinking about is how many brothers were killed together over the last few years. If we think about how many siblings died together in terrorist attacks, and now all our brothers, and on Parsha, the Parsha where we know, uh, what's the Pasuk, that your blood is, your brother's, uh, right, the blood of your brothers is calling out from the ground. I mean, in my mind, we weren't listening. We weren't listening. And now our, all so many of our brothers. So again, that's my my meaning here. That's how I'm taking it. Am I imposing that and saying that's the objective meaning? No, because we don't know. But I agree with you. That's the first thing. The second thing I'll say to you, Matty, on that point of Amalek, is that the one thing I forgot to say is that there's a critique of B'nai Israel in the first time Amalek attacks. And what's the critique? The critique is that they left their weak and and the the weak and the and the, the the mothers and the children at the back when they should have been at the front and that's why Amalek was able to attack the weak were in the periphery and therefore they were able to attack and so a lot of Khazal say that Amalek's attack is as much our fault as it is the fault of God or Amalek whoever else you want to blame and that would go hand in hand exactly what you were saying that we failed we failed to look after the people we were meant to look after. So again, as much as we can blame God, we, should, we also can look at ourselves. Persia. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Matty, just you're reminding me when you're saying about Micha Goodman, I, I read a post of Tehila. Um, the Tehila, yeah. She said that it's a Michael Tehila Goodman, Friedman, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she spoke about the concept of, of Judaism always has has two. You know, we have two two creations. We have two beta mikdashes. We have two. Yeah, I saw that. And often the second one comes along, and um, and and she says he says that he feels that this is somewhat like the second, uh, you know, um, war of independence. We're going to be starting again in a different way. Um, I, I think it helps us just build some narrative to help us through this. I don't know if it really does. You know, I feel of. The concept of a parent crying when their kids are going through this, I feel like a parent would want to interfere at this level of pain. So I just feel like, you know, some things speak to some people, some people don't, you know, for that feeling of totally. just as a parent, I would think that I would want to get more involved. But it is, is what it is. But I love the concept. I did love this concept of, yeah, we sometimes have a, a, a do-over and it sometimes has to be very, very painful to have a do-over. Um, but I feel that, you know, maybe maybe that's what we're going through. Yeah, Reba. I'm sorry. Thank you, Pasha. To do what to interrupt. I just want to. I just want to try and bring something more positive. I happen to have been in the south on that Shabbat. It was just by accident because I yeah, was in the south. But I just want to say, that, look at something positive. I know we're all looking at the negative. First of all, we can't give recriminations because the war is on. It's not the time for recrimination. But besides that, just look what. What happened was a disaster. There's no question there was a failure somewhere in there. But just look what happened from Sunday onwards. The army got itself together. It was already on the, getting things back to not what we would call ab abnormal but normal. By, by Monday, they were in charge. They knew what they were doing. They got down to it. Just think of the positive just for the moment. I mean, that is positive. The, it, they, they got themselves together. They, they realized they had to get themselves together. We're all talking about the negative, And it, 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 I think we should talk positive a little bit. Otherwise, I, we're I going to, think, we're going to get people... into terrible traumas here. It's going to be I bad agree. enough afterwards. People are going yeah. to, how people are going to live with what happened, I haven't got the foggiest idea. But at this moment, just thinking in terms of the positive a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I think, no, I don't think anyone was here was saying, ne meaning people weren't being negative about, I agree, I 100% agree with you. I think there was a failure, which we said, but I think, and we've said it a million times since Sunday, it's been unbelievable. Just look at what we've managed to do. And, and I know that, for example, um, uh, what's his name, Bennett, Naftali Bennett, what he keeps saying, and he said it again and again and again, I think he's 100% right. He says, look at the places in which, the majority of the places that were were actually in the end saved you and and the forces came in and they managed to he says the only places in which they couldn't save them were the places where Hamas were basically totally overrun them but any place in which the Kitab Konanuk was even halfway as good as Hamas they saved them 
And uh, you should look at uh, Bennett's post. They're very, very, it's it's really incredible. And and I, of course, Reba, and I think all of us recognize how unbelievable we've managed to look look at what's been going on not even just in the army i mean the armies are incredible and our soldiers are incredible but look at what's been going on as a society and i think there's so much positive but i also think it's okay it's to I have a not. space to have a space to say we're broken because i think we need to make space for that brokenness otherwise we're not going to be able to process it so so i think both both are important and they've got to be done almost Simultaneously. Simultaneously. Uh, yeah, exactly. God okay. Knows what's going to be after this war? I mean, I think we can't think more than a day. We can't think more than a day at a time. Genuinely, Miriam. And then after Miriam, I want to go back to to just going through the biography again. Miriam. Uh, unmute. Unmute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We've been speaking a bit about how all the good things, how we've been coming together as people, and it is truly amazing. And we saw this after 9-11. I, I was a program director, and I saw how Jews from everywhere started realizing their Jewishness. And it, we have to, we can't lose sight of the urgency it just and get complacent in our good deeds right now because there's also the opposite. There's also a point of a melech in everyone. And I've seen it with people that, that spark that hates the Jews is awakening just as strongly or even faster. And I don't know, I, I know, like, so we have to be cognizant of that and the, the force that that is bringing chaos to the, to the world and um, just keep pushing, every being the support to everyone we know, all the Jews that are disconnected, all the Jews that are connected, just to keep to keep fighting with this, the same koach um, as we go forward. 100%, 100%. We really have to be aware that we are now, and this is not the end of the battle, and the battle is also about Hasbara, it's also about getting the word out there. Um, although, as my daughter said to me, Zoe was talking about what happened with the hospital, the bombing, and how Israel, you know, at the beginning they thought was, and she said to me, Imma, even if we tell them the truth, they're going to hate us anyway. And I think there's a truth to that. They're looking for an excuse, but you know, like as in it's going to, the hatred's there, whether we like it or we don't like it and whether we prove that we bombed or we didn't bomb the hospital or whatever it happens to be. Anyway, in the meantime, let's go back to Rabbi Sachs. Um, okay, so his, very briefly, his biography. Can I just say Mar something? Oh. Yeah. Oh. Who, yeah. Michelle, yeah. Oh. Yes, Michelle, um, go no, ahead. No, just from what you were saying before, I just have to say yes, with, like I, I mentioned it before about the positive... But the thing is, which which hits me unbelievable, and they're so disappointed in humanity. I mean, I just never thought. I mean, I know it's obvious what I'm saying, but I'm just I can't because I've been, I've always been you know being product from Holocaust survivors and everything. So we've always lived with it, and I've grown up with it, and it's always been part of who we are, who I am really. I should say. I'm sorry. I think we've lost her. I think she disconnected by mistake. Okay. She'll come back on in a minute, I'm sure. Um, I, I think what what well, I'll wait till she comes back on, but I think what she was saying is 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 this future tense of Rabbi Sachs that we've been speaking about, but we'll come back to it because I do want to discuss it before the end of the class. Oh, the end of the class is in five minutes. Okay, so let, let's just finish the biography very quickly. He's born in 1948, uh, to Louis, to Louis and Libby, Louis and Louisa, Louis and Libby, um, who uh both of them um live uh, in England. I don't, I think they originally are not from England. Um, maybe we can enlighten us. Um, he has Brian, Alan and Elliot as brothers um, and a family of modest means, but, but definitely very proud Jews. In 1952 to 59, he goes to St. Mary's primary school. By the way, he does not go to Jewish schools, neither to primary nor secondary Jewish schools. Then he attends Christ College in Finchley. And um, in 1966, he goes to Cambridge. Um, they didn't exist, by the way. They did what? not exist. What, there what were no didn't Jewish exist? schools. There were no Jewish schools. At his, yeah, there was I Hasmonean. don't think so. 1948, yeah, there was probably. There was Hasmonean. There, there was definitely Hasmonean, 100% yeah, Hasmonean. Yeah, Hasmonean had just begun. You're right, you're right. You're there right. definitely was. Be, I know, for example, my father right, didn't go right, to Hasmonean right. because he didn't get into Hasmonean. He went, my father also went to non-Jewish schools, but but there were, there was, there was Hasmonean. Yeah, um, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no problem. Um, and then he goes to Cambridge in 1968. 
1967 is Six Day War. And that, Michelle, sorry, we we lost you. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm going to come back. I think I know what your point is. And I think it relates I was just, very much I was to just this idea of future that tense. I is about humanity, just the disappointment. And... Yeah, 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 100%. And I think it also goes back to this narrative of future tense. Do we have to constantly believe we're in survival mode from all the people who hate the Jews? Or can we take on a more positive stance? And we thought over the last decade, two decades and everything else, we were able to take a more positive stance, perhaps. Perhaps that's what Rabbi Sachs was talking about in future tense. Do we have to go back to that narrative of everyone hates us? And I think that's a big question that I want us to address next week when we look at future tense. I'm going to tell you which areas of future tense to look at before we, next we week. We learn that they say there's always going to be anti-Semitism and, and it's so obvious. I mean, we've that's what it says in the Tanakh and everything. We're always going to have that. And you kind of, you know, you grow up and you think, oh, today in the modern age, no, because everybody's about, you know, doing the right thing, humanity and everything. And it's just, and it's so obvious. It's yeah, just, you know... Yeah staring us in the face yeah so i definitely want to address this next time please god we'll talk in a second about what we're going to do next time um 1968 he goes and this is super super important 1968 this is the watershed in rabbi Sachs's life he decides after the six-day war when he kind of you, you read what he wrote where he all of a sudden realizes that his Jewish identity is actually super important he goes to america he buys a ticket to america he goes to america and he goes to meet two of the great uh, um, rabbinic personalities in America, Rav Soloveitchik and Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And those two meetings are meetings that change Rabbi Sachs's life. Um, and he realizes that he needs to invest in his Jewish identity in being a Jewish leader. In 1969, he um, gets his degree. In 1970, he becomes, uh, he researches moral philosophy under Philip. So it's a very important, it was one of a very, very important British philosopher at the time. 1970, he marries Elaine. In 1971, he becomes a lecturer in Middlesex Polytechnic, which by the way, is also super impressive considering he didn't even have his um, master's degree at that point. In 1972, he gets his master's. In 1973, he becomes a lecturer in Jewish college. 1976, he becomes a rabbi. 1978, he's appointed rabbi of God's Green Synagogue. 1981, he receives his PhD, finally, in uh, uh, philosophy. 1982, he becomes the uh, chair of modern Jewish thought at Jews College. 1983, he's the rabbi of Marble Arch, Marble Arch. 1984, he becomes the principal of Jews College. Now that, again, if you look how quickly he raced through a trajectory very, very quickly, which is really, really unbelievable and just shows it's kind of reflective of who he was and what his capabilities were. And in 1991, he becomes chief rabbi. There's a lot to say about his chief rabbihood, which we'll speak about a little bit later on. Um, and in 2013, he steps down. I want to just, I'm not going to read all of this. And I, those of you that, that 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 are new to the course, I really encourage you, you should have this source sheet if you've signed up for the course. If not, I, I can put it on the chat but at the end. So just hold on till the end and I'll put it on the chat. I really encourage you to read through these memories. We're not going to read all of them together, okay? They're really beautiful, some of them. Um, he speaks about his father, the influence of his family. Um, he speaks about, in university, what happens in 1967, which we read the first half. This is the first half of it, the second half we read together. Um, but I do want to just read with you um, two things that we didn't read last time as a class. The first is this one, which I think is really, really a window into Rabbi Sachs his personality, uh, what his own personal kind of existential makeup. He says, I have a persistent lack of belief. It's a, it comes from an interview between him and Elaine that's on his website. He says, I've persistent lack of belief in myself. There's some kind of pain, which is perhaps an inherited thing. There's a sadness in Jewish music, a kind of minor key that I heard when I was two or three years old. It's an existential sadness that I can't eliminate however hard I try. That's probably what allows me to communicate with people who are unhappy. Elaine is the balance in everything. When I was going through difficult times as chief rabbi, she was stable. It's not easy being the child of somebody in the public eye. She was the source of strength and confidence that our three children needed. Elaine is joyous, positive, always finding the good in people. She's the world's finest antidepressant. And it's very clear from here and other places that Rabbi Sachs really went through existential struggles. Um, what's amazing is the positivity that he's able to um, imbue to him and to other people, despite that. But the final thing that I really wanted us to meet, to read, which again, we didn't have in our last year when we looked at this, 
is the meeting between Rav Soloveitchik and the Babich Rebbe. And the reason why I want to read it for you is because to me, this is the watershed. This is the moment of change for Rabbi Sachs. And I will argue, and I have argued, that these two personalities are what are the, are the foundations and inform all of Rabbi Sachs' thought. Rabbi Soloveitchik and his idea of fate and destiny, and generally Rabbi Soloveitchik and his kind of ontological outlook at reality, which we'll talk about, I think informs a lot of Rabbi Sachs' thinking. And at the same time, and to in a totally different way, I think the Chabad and the Chabad outlook and the Lubavitcher Rebbe's outlook, and by the way, one of the first things Rabbi Sachs did was to translate the Chabad writings, I think that also deeply influences. And I think that Rabbi Sachs' philosophy is really an amalgamation of three different things. It's an amalgamation of Rav Soloveitchik's outlook, his existential and ontological outlook on Judaism. I think it's an it, amalgamation of the Chabad, the more Hasidic idea of Judaism, which comes through Chabad, the idea of good deeds, the idea of positive thinking. And the third thing, which I haven't added in here, but the third thing that's super important is his 1960s Cambridge education, which is essentially moral, the moral philosophy of the 1960s of Enlightenment philosophy, the moral Enlightenment philosophy, which also puts a great emphasis on freedom, on individual autonomy, on the idea of being of choice. And somehow Rabbi Sachs amalgamates all three of these things to bring out a very unique kind of Judaism. Next week, I know we've run out of time. You're going to give me two or three more minutes. Next week, I want to speak about what Rabbi Sachs, what's unique to Rabbi Sachs's philosophy before we even begin reading him? What is unique about Rabbi Sachs's philosophy? And that's going to be really important. I'm going to finish with this quote and then I'm going to tell you what I want us to, to read for next week. This is from The Great Partnership also. He said, Rabbi Soloveitchik, formidably erudite in every branch of philosophy, this is about his meeting with these two Gadol Hador, spoke about the need to create a new kind of Jewish thought based not on philosophical categories, but on halacha Jewish law. Law was the lifeblood, the DNA of Judaism, and it was more than mere regulation of conduct. It was a way of being in the world. Jewish philosophy in the past had based itself on Western counterpart and in doing so had failed to express what was unique about Judaism. It's focused on the holy deed. For two hours, he spoke with an intellectual passion and depth far beyond anything I had experienced in Cambridge. And here I'm going to stop. Rabbi Sachs, one of the greatest um, uh, uh, one of the greatest things that Rabbi Sachs brought to Jewish philosophy was the idea of the universal in the particular. And Rabbi Sachs, especially in his early books that we looked at, but his early books like um, Tradition and Untraditional Age and Arguments for the Sake of Heaven and Crisis and Covenant, in those books, Rabbi Sachs focuses on what is unique about Judaism and his focus is on halakha. And we have to remember Rabbi Sachs was deeply conservative with a small c, deeply conservative in his halachic outlook. He very much believed that Judaism had to maintain its particularity through halacha, and I believe that's what he got from Rav Soloveitchik. But listen to the second part of the encounter. My encounter with Rabbi Shnison was unlike any other. The first half of our conversation proceeded conventionally. I asked the questions, he gave answers. Then unexpectedly, he reversed the roles and started asking me questions. How many Jewish students were there at Cambridge? How many were actively identified with Jewish life? What was I doing for them? This was something for which I had not prepared. It was on a private intellectual quest with no larger intention. It was inter I was interested in my Jewish identity, not that of others. The began my reply with a typical English ev evasion. In the situation in which I find myself, the Rebbe allowed the sentence to go no further. You do not find yourself in a situation, he said. You place yourself in a situation. And if you place yourself in one, you can place yourself in another. We were losing Jews, he said, and each of us had a responsibility to do something about it. Years later, I summoned up that moment by saying how wrong people were to think of him as a leader with thousands of followers. Good leader, I said, creates followers. Great leader creates leaders. The Rebbe created leaders on a scale unprecedented in Jewish history. These were life-changing encounters. Rabbi Soloveitchik had challenged me to think. Rabbi Schneerson had challenged me to lead. A, this is such an important source in understanding who Rav Soloveitchik was, uh, who Rabbi Sachs was, and how he was influenced by these two greats. I want to finish by saying the following thing. Um, number one, I read that 
again, I read that quote two days ago and I kept thinking to myself about what we said, what we said about what Mordechai said to Esther, right? Where the chief, where the Babich Rebbe says to him, we don't find, you don't find yourself in a situation. You put yourself in a situation. And I think in so many ways, putting ourselves into a situation is what all of us need to be doing. Where do where can we put ourselves at the moment? What what is our call at this moment in 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 one of the one of the biggest moments in Jewish history? Let's be on modern Jewish history. There hasn't been a bigger moment than this for many 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 years. And the biggest question is what we can do now. For some of us, that will be getting out of bed in the morning, brushing our teeth, and dealing with our children. For some of us, it will be getting out of bed and messaging someone who needs a message of comfort. And for others, it will be organizing a chamal in their home like my brother's doing, right? And I'm bringing in hundreds and hundreds of suitcases from all abroad and, and sending them out. Everyone has different capabilities. Everyone has different means and different ways and different abilities. But all of us are being called upon to do the best that we can do at this given moment. So that's the first thing I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say. And I, and I think that Rabbi Sachs is still with us. He might be not alive anymore, but his word, and this is what we have to thank him for, the fact that he wrote books, the fact that he wrote prolifically, has allowed us to take his writings and to use them today in a time where he isn't here to give us his words of comfort. He's still here through his writings, and I think that is something so, so powerful. What I want to do next week is we're going to finish just looking at his biography. It won't take us very long, but I just want to show you a few other things. Especially, I want to show you the foundations, I believe, of his philosophy so that we have them in our heads when we approach his philosophy. I would like you to go back to future tense. Now, those of you who, who were with me last year already have the book. Those of you that are new, I highly encourage you, if you haven't got it at home, to buy future tense if you can. I know it's not so easy at the moment. If for some reason you're not able to get future tense, please let me know and I will try as much as I can to at least send you a PDF of some of the important things I can photo it and send it to you um so future tense and immediately after future tense we're going to be doing the great partnership so purchase both those books if you can um now i would like you for next week to please look at future tense i'd like you to look at chapter five anti-semitism the fourth mutation chapter six a people that dwells alone Chapter seven, Israel, Gateway of Hope. And chapter eight, A New Zionism. So four, so five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, those are very, very important chapters in understanding our dilemma today and what Rabbi Sachs might be saying to us about that dilemma. Okay, so to look through those, those um, I'm going to send you also some questions now. Another important announcement, those who are new to the course, we have a WhatsApp group. It is the easiest way for us to communicate with each other, for me to be able to send you things to read, and because I don't want to have to constantly be sending through my time secretary, it's far too complicated. I can send directly to you. If you, uh, if you can please, I'm going to put now my phone number on the chat, okay? If you can please send to me your a message, tell me your name and that you want to be added to the Thursday reading group, The th please specify the Thursday reading group. I will then add you to the reading group. And what I will do is as soon as I've added everyone to the reading group, I will send out the source sheets from today. And I will also send you out some questions for future tense. Okay, so um, just be sure to send me your name and that you want to be added to Thursday's group. All right, it has been... It has been a balm for me. I have spent an hour and a half not thinking of anything outside of this group and outside of this teaching. And that for me is catharsis in and of itself. I hope it's been the same for you. Thank you. Really thank you for joining us. I know it's not simple. Um, and I really look forward to seeing you all. I hope, I hope in person next week. If not in person, it will still be on Zoom. But uh, at least it we'll definitely please God, all see each other. Uh, apparently, Reba says it will still be on, on Zoom. I have a we, feeling. Mm, I have that horrible feeling. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I let's agree see. with we'll you, see. Reba. Uh, I, uh, let's I, see what the situation I, I is by then. Into a I was born when sirens went off. In, in, and I seem to be going around back to it. I'm trying to work out what evil's all about. And it's so difficult. 
I don't think I don't think any of us can work out what evil is about. I think the only thing we can do is it's, to fight it. I think that's yeah. that's the best that we can do. So with that, I'm going to leave you all and uh, wish you all a safe week. And yes, please, yes. God, we'll meet back next time. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank Thanks you. very much. God Thank bless. you. Everyone. Here we go. One, two, three.